Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this second special edition of DELEX webinar, Wednesday webinar, um, Managing ICP in the ICU. So our first speaker may be a low-key person, but a very uh, respectable. She is highly respected as a clinician, as well as, a, as an academician both locally and abroad. In fact, I first met her abroad in Hawaii at the Neurocritical Care um, Society Convention. So let me introduce her. She's a diplomate Philippine, of the Philippine Board of Neurological Surgeons, a fellow of the Academy of Filipino Neurosurgeons, a fellow of the Philippine College of Surgeons, chair of the Philippine Board of Neurological Surgery, Secretary of the Board of Directors of the Academy of Filipino Neurosurgeons. And as I said, she's uh, internationally known. She's a faculty and speaker of the ICRAN, ICRAN, WFNS, or World Federation of Neurosurgeons International Conference on Recent Advances in Neurotraumatology that is in Pakistan. So my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lynn Lucena to talk about Neurotrauma in the ICU. Dr. Lin, please uh, share your slide and open your video, please. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us in this webinar. I'm here to discuss about neurotrauma management in the ICU setting. This is my disclosure, my CV. And the objectives for this lecture is number one, I will define severe traumatic brain injury. These kinds of lesions that are found in severe TBI and also the updated 2016 fourth edition of Brain Trauma Foundation TBI guidelines and the use of mannitol and hypertonic saline in neurotrauma in the ICU setting. Traumatic brain injury is the leading cause of death and disability, especially in people younger than 40 years of age. 67 to 317, over 100,000 individuals are affected. And mortality for moderate injury can be 4 to 8%. However, in severe injury, it can rise up to 50%. Recently, there's an 80% mortality for severe TBI in 1950s, it has been reduced to 20% in the last five years. In the U.S., they perform 80,000 craniotomies per year for the removal of hematoma. Severe traumatic brain injury is a brain injury that results in loss of consciousness of more than six hours, and the patient usually has a GCS of three to eight. Worldwide, there are 195 million new cases of road injuries, and majority are due to motor vehicle and motorcycle accidents. In the Philippines, there has been an increasing trend from 65,000 cases in 2005 to 110,000 cases in 2017, and this is occurring only in Metro Manila. So you can see that there's higher incidence in the whole of the Philippines. And as we see from 2006 to 2015, it has increased 45.76%. And it has affected our GDP. So what are the lesions found in severe traumatic brain injury? You usually have diffuse axonal injury, focal shear injuries, contusions, and hematomas. Diffuse axonal injury is defined as a diffuse degeneration of the cerebral white matter, and it results in prolonged traumatic coma that is not associated with mass lesions or ischemic damage. It forms a continuous spectrum of increasing numbers of damaged axons. Whereas cerebral contusion is like a bruise, there are focal injuries in which small blood vessels are affected, and it damages the other nerve tissues and components in the parenchyma. 
cerebral contusions can actually evolve into hematomas, and the severity and signs and symptoms can depend on the location and the pattern of injury. Secondary brain damage, like ischemia and swelling, can occur when not managed initially. So hematomas comprise of different kinds, like epidural hematoma is like 2% of all types of head injury and can cause 15% of this can cause fatal head injuries. Only in 20% would you find the talk and die syndrome in which you have a lucid interval and may, uh, may have other associated injuries. And 73% of this occur in the temporoparietal region. This is an example of an epidural hematoma in the frontal lobe. So the management usually depends on the detection, which is very crucial. And patients' increased survival and uh, lessening of morbidity will be tantamount to early referral system and management. Manitol is in question mark here because at times when the patient is deteriorating, you can even use Manitol on the way to the operating room. But there are times when giving Manitol can actually reduce the edema or the increased intracranial pressure and may precipitate the increasing amount of epidural hematoma, especially if the hematoma is still evolving. So when the GCS score is eight and below, intubation and ventilatory support is necessary. And anticonvulsants may or may not be given depending on uh, the patient's history and also the severity of the GCS. So subdural hematomas, acute subdural hematomas, occur between the dura and the arachnoid space. It's usually venous blood, which is uh, due to rupture of the bridging cortical veins. And in, within four hours after injury, it can incur 30 to 90% of mortality. Severity of underlying brain damage will depend on ischemia and swelling. So this is acute subdural hematoma. You can see the severity of the compression of the brain. So management again, the ABCs are very important. Manitol can also precipitate enlarging subdural hematoma, so it's in question mark. And anticonvulsants can, may or may not be given. There's no um, hard and fast rules. And um, you need to watch out for secondary brain injury, which is ischemia and edema also. Intracerebral hemorrhages are also causes of severe traumatic brain injury and also subarachnoid hemorrhages. So the 2016 Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines in severe TBI is not actually a complete clinical protocol. It is a living guidelines model which comprises of 189 publications, five class one studies, 46 class two, 136 class three studies, and two meta-analysis. It discusses hyperosmolar therapy and gives a level 2B evidence in which manitol is effective co for control of raised intracranial pressure. Arterial hypotension with a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters mercury should be avoided. And manitol should be restricted to use prior to ICP monitoring to patients with signs of transsensorial herniation or progressive neurologic deterioration not attributable to extracranial causes. Level one evidence states that steroids is not recommended for improving outcome or reducing intracranial pressure. In patients with severe TBI, high dose of methyl pred was even associated with increased mortality and is definitely contraindicated. So again, dexamethasone has no proven benefit in severe traumatic brain injury and even traumatic brain injury because it does not outweigh the benefits, does not outweigh the side effects. Level 2A evidence is uh, with infection prophylaxis. And it says also that early tracheostomy is recommended to reduce mechanical ventilation days when overall benefit outweigh complications with such a procedure. There is no evidence of reducing mortality or rate of nosocomial pneumonia, however, with this early tracheostomy. Level 2A evidence 
is uh, with seizure prophylaxis. So take note of this, please. Uh, the use of phenytoinal valproate is not recommended for preventing late post-traumatic seizures. Phenytoin, it can decrease incidence of early post-traumatic seizures within seven days of injury if overall benefit outweighs complications. Early PTS have not been associated with worse outcomes and there's insufficient evidence to recommend levetiracetam compared to phenytoin regarding efficacy in preventing early post-traumatic seizures and toxicity. Level 2A in nutrition, feeding patients to attain basal caloric replacement at least by the fifth day and at most by the seventh day post-injury is recommended to decrease mortality. And level 2B evidence says transgastric jejunal feeding is recommended to reduce the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia. So there are other recommendations pertaining to the compressive craniectomy, prophylactic hypothermia, CSF drainage, and DVT prophylaxis. But I, I will go now again to reviewing the initial steps prior to admitting the patient to the ICU because this is crucial in the overall management. So again, e ABC pertains to airway, breathing, and circulation. And three specific endpoints are very crucial. Number one, you should avoid hypothermia. You should avoid hypoxia, number two. And number three, you should avoid hypotension. So essentials in the management comprises of isotonic crystalloids, normal PCO2, supplemental oxygen SPO2 of more than 90%. The head of bed should be inclined at 30 degrees to promote more drainage. Midline positioning, to prevent uh, compression of the venous uh, drainage and adequate pain control. And you can have sedation to decrease ICP. So after adequate resuscitation and the emergency room, these are the things that should be done. And an admission, uh, even before admission to the ICU, uh, osmotic therapy can only be, already be started. But as we saw, in the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, there's no level one evidence yet for osmotic therapy. And mannitol is an osmotic agent which, prevents, which promotes diuresis. However, the side effects can be acute renal failure, hyperkalemia, hypotension, and rebound increments in ICP. I will discuss it a little bit more later. And usually, the doses is 0.25 to 1 gram per kilogram of the body weight. Whereas hypertonic saline is given if tolerant, if the patient's tolerant to mannitol. And recent studies, however, has been promoting that this can be a primary measure to control ICP. And it can normalize resting membrane potential at, and also the normal intracellular electrolyte balance. These things will be discussed further in detail by Dr. Manolet Guerrero later on in the second lecture. So general clinical guidelines, you can have mannitol, which has an added benefit if there is intravascular volume overload. The goal is euvolemic. You maintain the patient, you should always with a euvolemic intravascular volume. Renal insufficiency can increase with supranormal serum sodium, but no ceiling yet to osmotic therapy limits. Hypertonic saline can increase the mean arterial pressure and it has an added benefit of improving cerebral perfusion pressure. <clears throat> and uh, also hypertonic saline is an effective hyperosmolar agent for the control of elevated intracranial pressure. It can be used in wide range of concentrations from 3%, most commonly used as continuous infusion, to 23.4%, which is typically used in intermittent boluses. When used as a continuous infusion, 3% sodium chloride may be titrated to initial sodium goal of approximately 145 to 155 milliequivalents per liter. It should be administered via central venous catheter because of the risk of extravasation injury when used with peripheral IV access. And the short-term peripheral IV access is permissible in the setting of acute ICP elevation, however. And it, uh, hypertonic saline has several theoretical advantages over mannitol. With hypertonic saline, volume depletion and hypovolemia does not occur, which makes this actually as an agent safer in trauma patients with ongoing blood loss, hypovolemia, or hypotension. 
it has a reflection coefficient of one and is less likely to leak into the brain tissue. However, the potential adverse effects can have can be circulatory overload and pulmonary edema and increased chloride burden. Manitol, on the other hand, post promotes osmotic diuresis by the osmotic pressure of the glomerular filtrate, which inhibits tubular reabsorption of water and electrolytes and increases the urine output. Its mode of action, however, in reducing ICP is less clear. It is thought that mannitol reduces intra uh, intracranial pressure by reducing blood viscosity, which transiently increases cerebral blood flow and oxygen transport and constricts the PL arterioles. This in turn reduces the cerebral blood volume and the intracranial pressure. But a serious concern with mannitol is, that, is its leakage into the brain tissue in patients with disruption of blood-brain barrier with a consequent reversal of the smaller gradient and thereby resulting to rebound cerebral edema. So this is a study of the effect of mannitol and the hypertonic saline in cerebral oxygenation of patients with severe traumatic brain injury. Uh, this was in Journal of Neurosurgery in 2009, in which a prospective non-randomized crossover study compares the effects of brain tissue oxygen tension of mannitol and hypertonic saline. They received mannitol as first-line treatment, but with repeated intracranial hypertension, they received hypertonic saline. Both were associated with a significant ICP reduction. However, at 60 and 120 minutes, hypertonic saline treatment was associated with a lower intracranial pressure and higher cerebral perfusion pressure than mannitol. It was also associated with an increase in oxygen, while mannitol did not affect the oxygenation. In addition, compared with mannitol, hypertonic saline was associated with lower ICP, higher cerebral perfusion pressure, and cardiac output. This, uh, the authors of this study thereby concluded that given as a second-tier therapy for elevated intracranial pressure, Hypertonic saline is associated with a significant improvement in brain oxygen, cerebral perfusion pressure, and cardiac output in patients with severe TBI and intracranial hypertension refractory to previous mannitol administration. Another study in critical care medicine by Kamel et al. in 2011 showed that hypertonic saline versus mannitol for the treatment of elevated intracranial pressure. They combined the studies and they found out that hypertonic saline is more effective than mannitol for the treatment of elevated intracranial pressure. Their meta-analysis, however, was limited by the small number and size, but the findings can be argued that uh, hypertonic saline was superior to the current standard of care and argue for a large multi-center randomized trial to establish the first-line medical therapy for intracranial pressure. Another study by Morta Savi et al. in Journal of Neurosurgery in 2012 had a hypertonic saline for treating raised intracranial pressure for a literary, literature review with meta-analysis. We all know that currently mannitol is the recommended first choice for a hyper or smaller agent for patients in use with elevated intracranial pressure. But some authors have already argued that hypertonic saline might be a more effective agent. However, there is no consensus as to appropriate indications for use, the best concentration, and the best method of delivery. The available data is limited by the low number of patients, the limited uh, RCTs, and the inconsistent methods between the studies. However, a greater part of the data, based on this meta-analysis, suggests that hypertonic saline, given as either a bolus or continuous infusion, can be more effective than mannitol in reducing episodes of elevated intracranial pressure. The meta-analysis consisted of eight prospective RCTs, which showed a higher rate of treatment failure or insufficiency with mannitol or normal saline versus HTS. So um, watch out for the next lecture for a more in-depth understanding of the mechanisms of hypertonic saline, specifically hypertonic sodium lactate, uh, which is uh, totila. Just mabalos sa Thank you very much for your attention.